Yes, I was actually born in Norwich, in Norfolk, on the 7th of January, 1923. Well, I was um, brought up in a market town uh, named Wyndham, which is W-Y-M-O-N-D-H-A-M, but <laughs> as spell, uh, that's how they spell it. But the way they say it, they, they talk about Wyndham. And I had a, a very loving uh, um, childhood, uh, considering that uh, I had I lost my wife, my, not my wife, my uh, mother, when I was three. And unfortunately, uh, I was never lost for any love or care. And uh, I think that I most probably didn't realise how lucky I was. And uh, when my father moved uh, to North Walsham, which was another small marketing town north of Norwich, um, he uh, allowed me to <laughs> appreciate you know, what had uh, been my early childhood. I joined on my birthday. I was 18 years old. <laughs> they gave me uh, a warrant to go and do to go to to go to Uxbridge to take my uh, exams, both medical and uh, scholastically. But it was 1938 that was really the most important part of it. And if uh, I think that. I was so keen to fly and get into the Air Force that I pestered the uh, recruiting uh, uh, officers and they said, son, when you, can, uh, when you start to shave, then you might be all right. But I still persevered and then eventually joined the volunteer task force because North Walsham was, was only five miles from the east coast and that meant to say that there was a lot of uh, rumours on the fact that there might be an invasion and if so, uh, they needed volunteers. The, um, I flew the first mission uh, in, a, in a Spitfire after I had qualified uh, on uh, the uh, we, uh, we do, uh, the advanced uh, aircraft in the Air Force in those days was a miles master, and then I flew uh, a Mark I uh, Spitfire, uh, and I can. Uh, remember it as well as anything that I got airborne and was fascinated with the aircraft and it was as easy to fly as anything I'd ever had and from that, uh, from that time on uh, we uh, were we completed our, tra our training on the Spitfire very very quickly because there was uh, uh, quite a shortage of uh, bodies there. Um, I had been selected not to use, not to fly Spitfires with uh, machine guns because the commanding officer, who was a gentleman, said that he believed that the side that did that had the best information and intelligence would win the war and that to get information we needed to have pilots who could go on reconnaissance and take photographs and uh, I think that the way he put it was, uh, uh, gentlemen, if you've got uh, an actual uh, identical photograph of some of the uh, 
important parts of the enemy's uh, development, um, you should be very proud about it. So we all knuckled down and um, I joined a squadron that um, was made up of Australians, New Zealanders and Canadians and there were three others. They were English one and I was one of them and I was a lucky one. Um, it depended on obviously uh, what, what you were going to do. If uh, you were going to take very low um, uh, photographs, you used a camera that was fitted to the side of your aircraft and, <clears throat> and invariably uh, you learnt to fly at round about 50 to 100 feet and you went through there very quickly uh, and inv invariably um, you, you, they weren't long uh, ranges. The, uh, but we had the advantage of actually flying at 36,000 feet and that's where your um, stereophonic or the, um, um, the fact that you could get the information when it became uh, an actual picture and, and the, inter the interpreters from that angle, uh, that angle and also from that height. So uh, the, that covered it and depending on what, where the target was, well of course you, you flew at uh, somewhere between uh, 20 to 35,000 feet. Uh, unless you were going down right low to get low pictures and then you re went over very low and very quickly. So you got below the Germans' uh, uh, aircraft finding. It was, I was uh, lucky enough to see what I thought was either the Charlottes and the guys there. Uh, dropped, uh, broke uh, radio sounds and t said that I thought it was. They said, get a picture and get home, or the words to that effect. So I went down and it was only as I was going past the uh, uh, ship that uh, I thought I heard a lot of hail uh, rattling about. And I looked and there was no rain clouds about and I couldn't understand it. But however, I, uh, having got done a, sh uh, a shot, I, I pulled up and climbed away as quickly as I could. And only to realise that I think that, uh, that they weren't uh, hailstones, they were uh, anti-aircraft <laughs> shells from the German aircraft because uh, I was smelling uh, the smoke and I put it on full throttle, climbed up as high as I could, went uh, de dead to the west uh, uh, and uh, um, couldn't see where I was, just hoped that I would get back somewhere to the uh, land. And when the uh, aircraft actually uh, started not only to get full of smoke but started to get very hot, it was obviously the fact that I had to get out, and I did. And uh, I was particularly lucky that uh, I landed uh, on the coast, almost, of Scotland. It turned out to be some, uh, some five miles south, uh, north of uh, Dalwini, and uh, I was, uh, 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 the, the fact that the aircraft was on fire uh, made it easy for me to make the decision that I must get out of the aircraft and again came into the training of it. The first thing that you did was uh, send out a mayday, disconnect your radio, disconnect your oxygen mask, 
uh, released the hood, turned the aircraft on its uh, side, on its back, and having taken off your uh, harness, you kicked the, the joystick, the uh, control, control column, and that sort of spat you out like a pee out of a pond. Landed quite not quite heavily, quite easily, and was busy getting out of my harness and um, collecting my parachute. And uh, I looked round, and there was a, a farmer who had a 12 uh, 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 shotgun in one hand and an Irish wolfhound in, in the uh, other hand. And I said something like it was a, a bloody awful day because uh, it was uh, sort of smearing. And he says, Och man, you're English. And he still didn't shoot me. But he, <laughs> he uh, we, the reason I say that is because um, with you what, wearing a May West, you're covering up all your rank and the Air Force uh, uniform in colour is not dissimilar to the uh, German Luftwaffe. And so uh, he took me back to his farmhouse and uh, gave me, uh, uh, his wife gave me a sandwich and he suggested that perhaps I would like something a little stronger than tea. And he assured me that it was very good because he made it himself. And uh, I was, uh, uh, he said, I'll take you to the nearest uh, village and uh, I'll, I'll saddle up, the, I'll get the horses into the cart. And he took me down to Dalwini to the police station. Well, it, it uh, the, what was the maximum speed of the Spitfire? Well, it depended, depended obviously on the mark of uh, Spitfire that uh, I was flying. And <clears throat> you've got to realise, I think, that as each uh, new engine came up and slight modifications, uh, went on in each, each, each aircraft as it ported up. And I flew um, one, two, uh, but these are marks, one, two, four, five, uh, seven, nine, and eleven. And of all those uh, aircraft, um, they were gradually improving in the speed and the uh, range and all the rest of the things. But of all the aircraft, I think that uh, I flew, the, the Mark 9 was the actual uh, best one. On my 90th birthday, I flew uh, a Mark 9 in New Zealand. Uh, which they had it out at Ardmore, and I went, my son uh, had r arranged for me, and that was an absolutely fantastic thing. <laughs> and the fellow, that, that had been modified to take a trainer, because after the war, uh, when they, uh, the Rolls Royce was still producing aircraft, and a lot of the um, countries around the world still wanted, I mean, the, the Irish, uh, the, uh, the Indian Air Force all wanted to buy them, but they wouldn't let their pilots go unless they had a, one aircraft that could have dual control. And so, with a bit, a bit of fortune, uh, my son and, uh, uh, knew that uh, he that the, uh, the, the Air Force in uh, New Zealand had a Mark 9 and so on, my nose about it. And uh, it, was, it was just like getting in, in your car again. And I went, we went up and, uh, of course, as far as um, 
my uh, doctor had been written down on the, the on my the, no loops, no aerobatics, and uh, and uh, because he said, and I said why, and he said, well, when you were twenty, your heart was different to what it is now when you're ninety, and but uh, I pointed out to the fellow that was flying with me that uh, if we went up and I did just pull it up and let it do stall turns, that wouldn't be uh, anything. And I said, if, if you do a barrel roll, um, that isn't pulling uh, uh, anything other than centrical force. That's not in pulling any G's on it, like uh, if you do a loop and pull out. And so he said, oh, well, we'll just do one up the top there. And when it came back, my uh, son said, how did he go? And he said, well, he said, um, on, on the barrel roll, he lost about 200 feet. He said, uh, but said he hadn't flown it for 70 years, I'll pass him. The fact that uh, my wife and I have been married for 77 years, and the secret of the success of that marriage has been the tolerance uh, and the sense of humour that we both enjoy.